beautiful creatures of the world and welcome back to Coffee with Carrie Lynn. It's a beautiful day in the far north of Maine up along the Canadian border in the crown of Maine. And I hope it's a beautiful day wherever you are as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Friday. Let's let our hair down, take the burdens off our shoulders for a little while. Go into the weekend with a lighter heart and in a more joyous mood. Maybe you're going to hang out with friends and family this weekend and all they want to talk about is the dumpster fire that is the world right now. You can use the topic of discussion on Freaky Friday here on Coffee with Carrie Lynn to steer that conversation into a more lighthearted realm and get to see and hear what your people in your inner circle think about the mysterious aspects of life. You'll be surprised how people open up when somebody brings up a really wild topic of discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, I like to think outside the box. I like to let my imagination run wild. I truly believe with my heart and soul that the impossible in life is truly possible. I like to talk about the experiences in life that people have that are totally stranger than fiction, that you would literally think this person is BSing you if they just stopped you on the street and told you about what just happened to them and they are totally freaked out about it. People don't talk about these things because it makes them look weird. Well, I'm the weird girl. I've always been the weird girl. And today we are going to be talking about near-death experiences. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, if you are watching me right now on Rumble or on YouTube, please subscribe to my channel, Coffee with Carrie Lynn. Give the video a thumbs up. Add in the comments, have you had any wild, wacky, stranger than fiction experiences in life? Have you had any mysterious experiences in life? Things that you just can't explain, but you know darn well that they happen, but you're wondering if they happen? Drop it in the comment. I don't judge anybody here. I love to hear uh, about people's experiences. If you're not comfortable dropping it in the comment, Email me at coffeewithcarrylynn at gmail.com. Email me your experience and maybe it will become a part of my show, Freaky Friday. If you are listening to me on Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube Music, or Amazon Music, think about subscribing to my voice-only podcast over on those channels and giving me a five-star rating. Now let's get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, I've always been the weird girl my entire life. My life began weird. My great-grandparents passed away before I was born. In fact, my great-grandmother passed away on February 12, 1970, and I was born on February 18th, one year later. I'm an Aquarian. It's my season, and it's almost my birthday. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, my grandparents migrated from Poland to the United States in the early 1900s. They went through the Ellis Island thing. They would had sponsors in this country. And my grandmother was born in 1914. She was the first American born in our family. That's on my dad's side of the family. And a lot of old world culture and customs came with my great grandparents from where they came from. One of the cool old world customs that often happened is when an elder knows that they are going to pass away and there is go there is a marriage that is going to happen in the family. My parents were engaged. My great-grandmother knew that they were engaged. They were to be married. She knew she would not attend the wedding and she wrote a congratulations card to the firstborn child, which happened to be me. This is just a custom that happens. Generally, a letter from the elder is written to the baby or a card is given to the baby um, from the elder that has passed on. Uh, it's a little wish you good luck in life type of thing. Maybe it has some experience, life, life wisdom in the letter or in the card is generally very generic and very explainable. However, the day I was born, my grandmother, who her mother entrusted her with this card, went to visit my mother at the hospital, see the new baby, which was me, and my mom opened the card, and it said, congratulations on your baby girl. 
which was kind of a freaky thing for my mom. Now, my mother, her history is completely and totally rooted in the beginning of this country. Uh, we had relatives that came over on the Mayflower. I am the 13th generation great-granddaughter of Samuel Gorton, who not only was governor of Rhode Island twice, but overthrew the crown to be governor of Rhode Island twice. Very good friends with Roger Williams and started his own religion called Gortonism. So that's my mom's background, very American. So this weird old world custom really kind of freaked my mom out. But that was just the beginning. I was about two years old and I was speaking and I started telling my grandmother about things that happened in her childhood that I had absolutely no knowledge of. She never told anybody about some of these things that I told her. As things would happen, I started speaking fairly fluent Polish. Now this was this was uh, kind of brushed aside by my parents because my parents were like, hey, she's, she's with my grandmother. I was with my grandmother all the time. They were like, my grandmother must be speaking Polish phrases. Now my grandmother rest assured everybody that she stopped speaking fluent Polish when her mother died because there was nobody to exchange with her. So that was my grandmother's story and she stuck to it. And after it was discovered, I could speak Polish. Shortly after that, I lost all knowledge of it. When I was much older, my grandmother would teach us the Polish equivalent to words such as forks and knives and spoons and cups and plates and floor and rub. So I had all the individual words, but I never spoke fluent Polish after that, after um, that brief stint I went through as a very young child. Now I used to freak my parents out because I would know things that I should not know about people that I did not know. I would um, have a lot of dreams about relatives that had passed away. And the biggest freak out was when my great grandfather on my mom's side passed away, her grandfather passed away. And several months after he passed away, I woke up in the morning and gave my mother a message from my grandfather about something I could not know about because I was not born at the time that it happened. And it was kind of a freak out thing. And this kind of kept happening, but it not only kept happening in the confines of our house, it kept happening when I saw people that I did not know in public, I would give them a message from Aunt Edna. And I did not know these people. They did not know me. There's this little girl that's coming up to them and speaking her mind. And that's where we get the phrase, if it pops in my, my head and flies out my mouth, sometimes we're both surprised. And that is a catchphrase for Coffee with Carrie Lynn. I was, um, my parents were a little afraid of me, but they did teach me how to keep that kind of stuff under wraps. And life went on and proceeded. And I really knew what it was like to be a person who knew things that I should not know. I had a hard lesson as a teenager and I kind of all but stop talking about it and with friends and stuff like that because it was just it was kind of a little traumatic experience and I was really pointed out as the weird girl in school and that's a hard thing to to take when you are very very young kind of smacks your ego a little bit but as life has it life went on and I got involved friendships and had friends that were into this kind of thing and I was kind of a little amazement to them and they would ask me questions and two or three days later I'd give them the answers to the questions and I'd meditate on things and I just knew things and so I have a great group of friends that know that I'm capable of these wild uh, weird wacky and wild things that I can do and uh, we call them my gifts at this point because it's the only polite thing you can say about it. Fast forward from my childhood, I was 24 years old when I had my near-death experience. I was giving birth to our youngest child. Throughout the pregnancy, I had had two prior pregnancies, and this pregnancy, this third pregnancy, was very strange. It was very weird, and I kept telling my obstetrician that there was something that was definitely wrong. The pregnancy didn't feel right. There was, there was something nagging at me. 
And of course, you know, people, everything's fine. All the tests are coming out fine. You're going to sail through childbirth. It's going to be okay. And I started talking about things like, what if I die in childbirth? Um, I made out a will. I mean, I was really going into this. And, and my mom was like, stop being so morbid. You're, you've had two babies. You're going to have the third baby. Everything is going to be fine. Don't be morbid about it. Right down to the fact that I, I knew what I wanted our child to be named. I, the whole nine yards. And it was really kind of freaky to some people. Especially my husband, my mother, our really close relatives. And everybody assured me everything was going to be fine. On Easter Sunday, 1994, I gave birth to a very healthy, very large baby. I never had any drugs or epidurals or anything during my labors. So I did not want one for this child because I had a feeling that something was going to go wrong. My obstetrician ended up, because the baby was born a week early, he ended up going home for Easter that year to his family in Rhode Island where we had just come from. Um, he was His family lived two towns over from where we grew up. And um, he was in Rhode Island having a lovely dinner with his family, and we had a doctor that was on call, very young and very inexperienced. Then I told this young guy, listen, there's something wrong with this pregnancy. I don't think I'm going to make it. And he assured me everything was fine. We were going to sail through this labor, this birth. It would be fine, and I'd see everything would be marvelous. Right after our child was born, I hemorrhaged and I was not giving up the placenta. So this inexperienced young doctor, instead of sending me to the OR and getting things straightened out, he decided he would take care of everything right there in the birthing room without anesthetic and not really, I don't think, knowing what he was doing, but I didn't know better myself. So, you know, all my other, I had high risk pregnancies, but I also had for the first two babies, I had the doctor who delivered me as a child deliver our first two children and highly experienced guy. And he could handle all of the things that happened during my previous labors and deliveries. But the young guy, he handled it a completely different way. I ended up, um, hemorrhaging. And we didn't know at the time how bad it was. They trying to fix everything right there in the birthing room. And the doctor announced, although I felt really funny and I had lost a bit of blood, that I would absolutely and totally be fine in a few hours. My husband and my mom went home to pick up the older children who were being babysat at the house to meet their new baby brother. And when they got back to the hospital, um, I was dying and I was completely bleeding out. Now, people often ask about what happens after you pass away. What is there? And a lot of people, especially if you are going through an illness that you know that you are not going to recover from, there is a lot of fear in not knowing what to expect when you cross over into the afterlife. I am here to tell you that there is an afterlife. I have been there and I have come back. When I was dying in the hospital bed, when my husband came came to the hospital, he walked down the floor and there was nurses frantic. There was the crash cart was being brought into the room. And of course he left the children in the waiting room with my mother and he just flew down the corridor. And, um, when he got into the room, I was barely conscious and the nurses were screaming at me to breathe. I had to keep breathing. I had to hold on. I had to fight. And the bed was just absolutely totally soaked with the hemorrhage. And I remember one of the last things I remember was the nurse grabbing me and she gave me a little shake and she said, just breathe. And then 
consciously I knew my heart had stopped, I saw a green light above my bed in the corner of the hospital room. And I started going to that green light. And I could see the entire sphere of that room. When I looked down, I, I was just there. I was pale. I could see the nurses were absolutely frantic. My husband was at the end of the bed. The only thing he could do at the time was reach out and touch my foot. And I could hear the nurse say, she's gone, she's gone. We lost her. And then I was at peace. It was total, absolute peace. And I don't know for how long I was in that realm. It was, it was very peaceful. It was very comforting. It was very loving. I'm not sure how long I was there. But I do remember... I can't say it was like really a conscious choice, but it was stay or go. And I, I knew I could stay and I, or I knew I could go and I could go back to my husband. And then all of a sudden the peace started drifting away. I kept thinking or feeling that it just wasn't my time. And where were my people and, and things like that were going kind of, through me, their feelings, they weren't thoughts. I wasn't afraid. I was happy. I was blissful. But I was kind of alone-ish. It was strange. And next thing I know, just as the nurse was about to put the paddles on my chest, I took a breath. <gasps> just like that. And it scared the hell out of the nurse. And it scared the hell out of everybody in the room that they were just inches away from smacking me with that paddle. I had no pulse, no heartbeat. And all I could feel was my husband touching, rubbing, and massaging my foot. And that was the first time I hemorrhaged. Two weeks later, I hemorrhaged again because they didn't do proper procedures. And it was, like I said, it was a very young, new obstetrician and certain things weren't done. I didn't get a DNC. And therefore, nothing was really investigated. I had stopped hemorrhaging in the hospital. I had stayed in the hospital for five days. Um, I had stopped hemorrhaging. They sent me home. And a week and a half after that, I hemorrhaged on my bathroom floor uh, in our house. And it was a very frightening experience for everybody around. My husband had uh, some friends over. And I just called out to him and I said, uh, I'm hemorrhaging. You have to get an ambulance. And they called the ambulance. And the entire time I was completely conscious. And the EMTs came and I spoke to them. And they're looking for a pulse. And they're trying not to freak me out. But I absolutely had no pulse. Although this entire time, I was assuring everybody that I was not going to go anywhere. I had a child to raise um, that, you know, I told my husband over and over again, I'm not going to die. And they're like, where the heck is this chick's pulse? They got me to the hospital. All total, that it was fine. I spent another week in the hospital. All total, I had about seven pints of blood run through my body within the month that my son was born. And that is my near-death experience. And um, if you're wondering or if you're frightened about what is on the other side, from what I experienced, what is on the other side is love and kindness and beauty and serenity and peace. And my entire life, I know I have something to do here on on earth in this earthly body. Um, I know I'm part of a larger plan. I really started after, after that whole experience happened, I started to not be so embarrassed about the gifts that I have. And I started to open up more to the natural world that I lived in. And I want that experience again. I, I mean, I don't want it right now. <laughs> I don't want to curse myself. I don't want it right now. But there's always something in me that wants to get back 
to that place I was just hours after my child was born. I want to get back to that sense of peace, love, serenity, tranquility, and wholeness. It was really a wholeness experience. I just, I felt so alive. I felt like I was home. I felt like I was supposed to be there. But um, for some reason, I came back. And here we are sharing the story of my near-death experience. If you have had a near-death experience or you want to share any wild, wacky, stranger-than-fiction experience that you've had in your life, drop it in the comments or give me an email at coffeewithcarrylynn at gmail.com. And I'd love to share your experience one day on Freaky Friday on Coffee with Carrie Lynn. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful creatures of the world, thank you for listening to today's show. And carpe diem, because no one promised you a tomorrow.